dear audience, welcome back from lunch. And now, uh, after this beautiful presentations in the morning, now I'd like to announce panel number two, expectations of business from B20, in company with moderator, uh, moderator John Sambasharan Symes, president of the board of directors of Turkish Industry and Business Association, TÜSİAD. And uh, the invited speakers of this panel will be Dr. Dr. Johannes Tayson, Chairman and CEO of E.ON, John Rice, President and CEO of Global Growth and Operations of GE, and Dr. Werner Brinker, CEO of EWE. The word is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, okay, both. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. We had a wonderful morning. Uh, we listened to uh, keynote speak speeches and also G20 uh, panel. Now we are going to turn to business leaders. Uh, I have three very distinguished uh, panelists. Unfortunately, Mr. Bruno Besser couldn't join us with uh, last minute uh, agenda changes. He, instead of Istanbul, he is in Milan this afternoon. Uh, but I have three very uh, prominent business leaders from energy sector with me here. Uh, what are we going to do? Actually, um, we are, I have two overall questions to my panelists, and i like them to uh, comment uh, approxi approximately five minutes each. And then after the second question, I would like to open uh, questions, but then we'll continue. It, I hope it will be a relaxed debate rather than very formal presentation. I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Johannes Tyson. Uh, he's chairman and CEO of AON. Uh, following the first panel especially, can you please talk briefly around five to seven minutes, uh, your general views and opinions regarding today's forum, global developments in energy sector, and how you view them. Uh, please, let's start with you, and then we'll continue with other colleagues. Thank you. And um, first and foremost, also thank to Sabanchi University for organizing once more the meeting. I think it's a fruitful event, and uh, I'm honored to be here again. I think it's my third time. Uh, so I start to be a veteran of the meeting, I'm afraid. Um, now, when I listen to the uh, B20, uh, G20 expectations and, and wonder on, on the view of, of, of the sector, the business sector, um, I think for us it's the question how to translate ambitions of governments into investable and profitable business opportunities. Um, I think uh, the fundamental view uh, that was shared this morning on um, security of supply against um, threats to, to a variety of, of transportation venues and other things is obviously of high importance because um, you cannot make good business without a secure environment, uh, otherwise the, the risk costs are to the business. too high and uh, make it uninvestable. Um, I think the sustainability of the business against climate ambitions is, is of utmost importance because building a business model against the fundamental belief of the global population that uh, mankind needs to fight climate change, I don't think it's, it's um, at least not for a major corporation, it's not an investor business case to work against fundamental beliefs of your customers. And um, reliability becomes more an issue. I think it's not typically mentioned in, in, in, in these, in these uh, outstanding issues. But I sometimes wonder if uh, security of supply will become of, of lesser importance over time. I, don't, I would not underestimate the African situation as Fatih has, has, has raised it, and there it stays a fact. But for a significant part of the world, I'm not so afraid that energy will not be accessible and that there will be not sufficient supply. I think there will be rather sometimes significant oversupply. But that does not necessarily mean uh, that you have reliability of supply and that you can build sustainably, uh, sustainable business models um, in, in those societies that may be oversupplied at times and undersupplied at other times that can be a, a very different and very difficult environment to work in 
for utilities, energy companies, but also their clients. And therefore, I think this issue of reliability uh, will become of a higher importance. I think governments still sometimes underestimate it. They are still consumed in the back mirror. <coughs> is there enough energy? Uh, I think the issue will rather be, is, is there qualitative energy at the right spots, and not is there any kind of energy anywhere? And um, now, if you look um, on the world, how at least uh, we in my company and I personally see it, I think we go through fundamental shifts in, in, in our industry and in our, in our environment. I think this technology change that we have spotted through the last decade is becoming more pronounced. Um, I think the opportunities of producing power and of sourcing gas locally or in a distributed fashion is becoming significantly more pronounced. And, um, so it is not always, you know, these, these traditionally you always look from source, to, uh, from, uh, from source to sink, and you thought about big volumes and central production and uh, global sourcing, and then you made it local. I think uh, we will be in a multi-local society, mm -hmm. and adapting yourself to that and make their profitable business opportunities um, is possible, but will not be easy. Associated risks will be significant, and thus um, a smart adaptation of business models to those new risk environment um, will be vital. Um, what is a potential consequence for, for businesses? I think there will be a variety of, of, of, of options available for business leaders. Um, it starts with those that everybody shares. Is a market, is a business uh, in the investable as such? Or is it being negatively inflicted by governmental intervention, uh, dysfunctional markets, uh, subsidies that change and come and go? Therefore, I, th I would think um, business and government should share the objective to have a country and a business investable. And uh, each side has to do its thing for it. Uh, the government needs to set uh, terms uh, where the regulatory framework is adapted to the, to the, to the challenges of the equation, phase out uh, wrong subsidies, make, uh, make support seems you know, sustainable, but then let the market uh, develop the right answers. Um, a second thing is, in this new world that we see that is much more local, I think the two there are two, two drivers of change. The one is technology, innovation, uh, very hard to plan for government or business. And the second thing is customers' preferences. Yes. I think in the end it will be the customers that decide about what kind of energy transformation, energy vendor, however you call it, will happen in a, in a given society. And therefore, enabling and strengthening the final customers to do their choices is of utmost importance. And any system that, that still has enforced tariff systems Cross subsidies is limiting that choice, and that choice leads to abuse and, and, and misuse, as Fatih also said, and it leads to a delayed innovation cycle because customers get the wrong signals, uh, get lazy, uh, don't adapt to, to opportunities, energy efficiency gets delayed, uh, distributed opportunities get delayed, or money gets spent in the wrong fashion. Therefore, you know, those misled interventions or that the fear <coughs> against the end customer is wrong. And therefore, I think any government that is still influencing final customer markets is not doing something good for them. It is doing something to their, that is bad for them because otherwise all people would get in the driver's seat and drive the change and adapt to the change and create new opportunities. Therefore, I would call for governments whilst to be regulated maybe on the way how they do the CO2 policies, be extremely liberal when you come to the customers. Allow them to do uh, their choices. Uh, because any infringement is not helping them, it's hindering them. Um, those, and, and you see that that is a case, I just come f a few weeks ago, I came from Okinawa, which is also far away as we all know, and we had the World uh, Energy Summit there of power associations with global CEOs from around the world. 
and you see that customers drive the change, sometimes more pronounced than governments. In South Australia, 25% of all power comes from solar. And they, since years, don't have support schemes. Customers do it by themselves. Yeah. And the government is not helping, it's hindering sometimes the creation of those, of those events. Therefore, I would say for governments, set the framework, enable the customers, and make the framework adaptable to the new world. Yes, you have undispatchable sometimes uh, volatile things in there, and therefore you need a robust backbone of your, of your system. And uh, power needs to be available for vulnerable customers that don't have the opportunity for choices, and for steel mills or heavy energy users that cannot produce locally. And for that, you need a sound backbone of your grid. So if you need a sound TSO system, you need a scheme for providing conventional power that is not just reacting to the incremental production price of power, but for the, for the dispatchability of it. And that needs to be rewarded because otherwise it will not be there when needed. Um, those for the first more than seven minutes would be a, a shot to initiate the debate, I would say. Thank you very much. Uh, before I over to uh, Mr. Rice, I think I like uh, in summary, what you said, market to develop right answers. I think that's clearly explained B20's role. <laughs> let's, let's hear your comments. Yeah, Thank you. I, th I think uh, governments aren't good at picking <laughs> winners and losers, generally. So, you know, markets have to perform that function. The question is, is are we willing to be patient and let the markets do their job in a world with social media and digital technologies where there's more pressure to produce results quicker. And I think that's, that's a fundamental question. For us, uh, social media has become a form of a demand generator because it puts pressure on governments everywhere to build out infrastructure because people in the middle of, of China or in the, in the desert in Sub-Saharan Africa now have knowledge about what they don't have, and they have a way to vote. Maybe not with a ballot, but but they can they can display their displeasure. So the intensity around infrastructure build out is as acute <coughs> as it's ever been. I'd like to to offer a couple of comments in the context of this morning's remarks. Some of which were around this notion of sustainable, inclusive growth, which you hear about in. Every country I go to, there's this, this idea that people are being left behind. And the answer is sustainable, inclusive growth. What do you need to achieve that? Well, there are some very basic elements, and one of which is the one we're going to be talking, we're talking a lot about today. But first, you've got to have jobs. If, if you don't have real jobs, then you don't have an economy that can be either sustainable or inclusive. You need to, to have good job creation, you have to have human capital and financial capital. And you can't have any of that without energy. If you don't have electricity, and as we heard this morning, a billion and a half people or so around the world lack it, if you don't have electricity, there's very little that's good or that contributes to sustainable and inclusive <coughs> growth that doesn't have a plug. So you have to have real energy policy, or you can't even begin to talk about sustainable, inclusive growth. And you look at a country like Nigeria with, with 160 or 170 million people and five gigawatts of installed power capacity. There's no way to get to sustainable, inclusive growth unless you fix that. No way. So what are the barriers? The barriers that we see are government bureaucracies. If you look under the covers in a lot of countries, Government bureaucrats aren't paid to go fast. They're not paid to take risks. They think if they go fast and make a quick decision, they'll be accused of being corrupt. And I'm talking about a lot of countries in Latin America and Africa and a lot of places that all of you are familiar with. So, so government bu bureaucracies have to start to recognize that this is what they need to do for the population. And, and you got to have energy policy which which looks out over the long term in a world that's become very short term. And, and in too many places that I travel to, it becomes the, the comments to me around, well, what can you do before the next election? Not, 
what's the right 10 or 15 or 20 year investment program and how do I have reg regulations and a regulatory environment which gives investors the confidence that they can go to country A or B or C and invest and receive a decent risk adjusted return. If you have a regulatory environment that changes overnight and the rules change and all of a sudden what you thought was a pretty good profile gets turned upside down, that capital is just going to go to another country where they can, where they can find that. So the, the, the, the expectations that I would have of the B21 first is to look hard at the Brisbane work and decide what can be built on that. I think, I think too many times we go from B20 to B20 and there's not enough continuity and I think we confuse the G20 when we come up with a brand new set of recommendations. So I think we need to look hard at, at some of the recommendations <coughs> in Brisbane that should be carried forward to this, this uh, B20. I think we've got to be very open to new ideas like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that China is leading, that some 50 countries have elected to participate in and with some notable exceptions, I think we have to embrace ideas that help capital get connected to infrastructure projects. McKinsey and others have studied the world's demand for infrastructure. There's some four trillion required, about three trillion is getting spent every year. There's a trillion shortfall, and a lot of that shortfall, some of it's attributable to the decision-making processes that I referred to before. Some of it's a function of connecting capital to those infrastructure projects. We have to fix that, and, and I frankly applaud efforts like the BRIC Bank or the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that will help connect, help figure out how to solve the problem and get financing to the infrastructure that's needed, and the power infrastructure is a big piece of that. And, and transparency, I mean, if you, if you look at Brisbane, there was a lot of discussion about about transparency and credibility in the decision-making process. I think that's a very important theme to carry forward because that gives investors confidence and it lets us go where we need to go. I, I, think, I think for the private sector, I mean, I, I think you'd hear a version of this from all three of us, it's, it's visibility, and if we have visibility and consistency, we're gonna be bigger and better and more long-term investors in, in markets like Turkey and many other countries around the world, and I'll stop there. May I ask you an additional question, because we touch upon that uh, meeting after meeting, we talk about the similar things. I mean, previous session, actually, Anna mentioned that G20 has to understand to launch international governance, because you touch on, on transparency. I mean, can you elaborate? Uh, on that, uh, you think we need a stronger international governance system to solve this problem and maybe also the long-term strategy as well, as well as transparency? I think, I think we, we need that. I, I think that's a very, very high level, kind of hard to argue with concept. What does it mean on the ground in Nigeria, in Angola, in mm -hmm. Kenya, and how could we use a combination of, of private enterprise and public, maybe NGOs, to create a framework that countries can adopt that facilitate this bureaucratic decision, you know, speed and decision making in the bureaucratic process, because that's really what has to happen. These countries have to make decisions faster. They've got to make them in an open and transparent way, and, and there are, if you look at the the three companies here, we, we all buy a lot of things, we spend a lot of money, we negotiate, we procure, and we do it with openness and transparency, and we deliver a pretty good benefit for our shareholders. So we know how to do it. I think we can teach, but I think that I think we need a facilitator, and maybe whether it's the World Bank or the or the IMF or uh, I don't know. Institutions. Okay. Thank you. Now I will uh, ask Dr. Werner Brinker to comment on this morning session, especially the previous panel, if we hear your comments. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I have to thank uh, the organizers, especially 
especially uh, Sabanji, um, that um, I'm able to, to sit here and to, to talk to, to each other. Um, and I'm always happy to be in Turkey, and, and this especially in uh, Istanbul, uh, because I've stayed here f some 40 years ago for the first time, so, and, and I'm very proud about the development and the, um, um, how uh, Istanbul, the city, developed. <clears throat> so f looking to the uh, discussion this morning and to the uh, different uh, ideas, first of all, I uh, have to say I'm, I'm very glad about uh, the talk of Mr. Bior when he uh, said that uh, we have to stop the subsidies and uh, the oil prices and natural gas prices worldwide uh, because <clears throat> without any, um, if we subsidize prices, there's no chance for uh, energy efficiency or energy saving, savings. So looking at the overall uh, goal, uh, that means the two um, degree um, goal um, in the atmosphere, we have to, of course, save the energy, we have to increase the energy efficiency, and of course we have to invest in renewables. <coughs> but the main thing is <coughs> that there is a worldwide understanding to act for, these, for this goal, that the, the governments would commit to the two uh, degrees centigrade goal uh, worldwide <coughs> so that this, we are operating at the same conditions worldwide when we are as, as, as companies are investing in the different countries. So that is, um, <coughs> in my opinion, the main thing to, to act and to, to look for. So <coughs> looking to uh, our businesses, <coughs> EW is not a company um, that is producing natural gas or oil. We are not producing electricity from huge power plants. <coughs> we are serving uh, natural gas and electricity to um, some millions of customers. And uh, therefore, <coughs> from our experience, <coughs> the customers will say what, they, what we have to do. <coughs> and in the former times, and especially in Germany, um, <coughs> we, have a, we have had a monopoly. And we decided how to invest, where to invest, and what kind of solutions we want to serve to our customers. Nowadays, the market has changed dramatically, especially, of course, <coughs> due to the internet and to the, dig um, to the digital te technologies <coughs> uh, in, uh, worldwide. <coughs> so, the, the forces of the customer, the force of the customers, is tremendous, and we have to look what the customer's aim is and what the customer's wish is, and we have to look for it. Um, <coughs> and therefore, I think we have to be to, uh, to stay in very close contact to our customers um, and get all these information and ideas from our customers and to create new ideas together with them, especially for the market and especially, of course, for um, to for, for, uh, to reduce. Um, the um, climate um, problems. <coughs> I would like to pick up one, one, one issue that, that you brought up. Um, it's, it's a governance issue from, that is given for energy policies. And obviously I could also, if you wish, talk for an hour what is bad in governance in, in countries and, and regions. But I think that doesn't always help. Sometimes acknowledging progress also helps. And, um, and if I would look at, at, at Europe, while there's a lot of things to challenge in energy policies, the governance has tremendously improved uh, since last year, tremendously. If you look at, we for the first time now have a commissioner that is responsible for energy and climate, so that you know, there's not always those infights between energy and climate. The same thing happened, by the way, in my home nation in Germany, where the minister is also now responsible for energy and climate. I would believe that that has helped to foster some decisions. Secondly, we have now a vice president for the energy union in Europe, coordinating seven commissioners, making sure that only those things come to rulemaking that are of utmost importance, and not that every commission of 28 commissioners creates his new set of rules uh, just to deliver an interesting agenda. It's now all lined up against some headlines, some outstanding issues for Europe and the world. That is a tremendous progress. And then that the Juncker Commission, as its first piece of work, has delivered a holistic piece of, of, of insights how to create an energy union. And then what pillars it consists of, I also think, is significantly more than we had in the past. So those things, I would say, that come more from the governmental side, having a true holistic agenda 
and not just piecemeal peace work of, of, of lots of ministers or commissioners, have governance around it, coordination around it, uh, putting things together, I believe is good and it should be a role model for other parts of the world potentially. It should also allow intergovernmental um, decision making in Paris and beyond. Um, and when it comes to content, I also think we have made progress. Uh, we, uh, the, the heads of government embraced the new 2030 targets. And that was also far from certain, that Europe now embraces a 40% CO2 reduction target and sets the agenda again, and has that as the only outstanding target and others as of lesser importance and lesser reliability, I think, is right and should steer an environment that allows business to react to that and implement technologies that foster those, those, those goals. Um, that they now put in a government, a governance around the ETS reform, it looks like. They also come to conclusions there is significant progress. So if I, if I should draw a conclusion on, on, on improvements of governance and improvement of, of, of, of, of goal setting, I think the last year was rather a good year and not a bad year. Obviously, there's lack of rulemaking around for, for the reliability, uh, for the empowerment of the customers, I would still say there's, there's room to improve, but there is significant progress. And um, I, I think, you know, we, governments don't like always to be policed and be told by business, you know, you're all stupid. Uh, if there is good progress, I think it needs to be embraced and also shown because then the likelihood of copying is higher than if you all, all, all, always only criticize what is, what is bad. Before I go to second round, uh, another question from previous panel. Switzerland uh, exhibited a great uh, energy efficiency program and it was uh, introduced as one of the champions. Do you think there is some correlation what Switzerland do with your countries and you know and you know you operate and your organization how how you see energy effic efficiency agenda moving forward? <clears throat> I think um, that is the main goal for the next uh, years <clears throat> um, to to increase the energy efficiency <clears throat> by new technologies <clears throat> or or by energy savings. Um, um, if we look, if we look to the overall goal of two, two degrees, <clears throat> that means we have to reduce CO2 emissions dramatically. And then Europe uh, has decided to de decrease the CO2 emissions in the year two till the year 2050 by 80%, in Germany 90%. And that means we will not be allowed in that year, in the year 2050, to allow, we are not, will not be allowed to burn natural gas, oil, or coal. And that is a dramatic uh, situation for our companies <clears throat> involving in the energy business. <clears throat> that means we have to transform our total business, the, the historical business model. When we started our natural gas business 60 years ago, it will not be, we will not be in the natural gas business in the year 2050 because there is no market for us. If we want to uh, get, reach this goal of uh, uh, CO2 reduction by 90%, <clears throat> so we have to look for new business models, not only in Germany but in other countries as we, where we are investing, like in Turkey. Um, so, <clears throat> but the, the the question is, how will we reach this reduction? How will we get to this goal? And that means we have to invest, of course, in renewables. We have to reduce. Um, the energy consumption overall in the different uh, markets and, and of course we have to, to invest in new technologies. And looking to the, um, to the traffic, the e-mobility will come of course. The only question for me is, is it will it be an e-car based on a battery or will it be based on a fuel cell together with hydrogen? So and all, uh, also in this uh, sector, business sector, there will be a dramatic change. Um, and we have to look for it, and we have to look for a new solution on that. And energy efficiency is the main thing for the next years. Okay, thank you very much. Now I am going to move to second question, and probably around five minutes, and then we'll come back to the audience uh, for additional questions. Uh, what are the key challenges uh, you think for energy industry 
what develops uh, for the next 10 years for global energy markets? How you see the future? Shall we start with you? Okay. You want to read? No. Go ahead. You can pick up. You need to set it all, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, <clears throat> I think, uh, Globally, energy, this isn't necessarily the case in, in, in Europe or the United States or developed countries, but globally, energy is going to be, I think, developed in more distributed ways. I think there is that this point we talked about before about a billion and a half people in the world that lack access. Yeah. Transmission and distribution in the grid will not get to everybody in my lifetime, and I and suspect in a long time. So. So distributed power technologies, smaller power block sizes, wind that's more efficient and runs you know, with lower wind speeds. The, the technology around wind really has developed quite significantly in the last 10 or 15 years. And, and all the credit for that, in my opinion, goes to the Europeans, you know, that, that we wouldn't have a wind industry, in my view, if, if Europe hadn't recognized in the 90s that it was important technology our company invested in early 2000 time period and since then we've seen the cost per kilowatt from wind you know drop by two thirds and is capable of going down further with larger rotors and more advanced technology so i think a lot of the next 10 years in the in the in the global markets largely the the developing countries is going to require uh, different forms of power generation, more, distrib more distributed biofuels and, and uh, equipment that can run on different fuel sources, and then a, a big effort to connect fuels with need. So there's, there's areas of the world, as we all know, that are awash with, with, with oil and gas, and then there's area, areas of the world that have none of it, and how do you connect the gas to the places that might operate gas turbines or some form of gas power generation if they had access to the fuel? So there's going to be a focus on transportation technologies and I think a focus on, on distributed power uh, even more so than we've seen in the last 10 or 15 years. Thank you. Maybe this time we can start with you, Dr. Lee. Yes. Um, looking to the technical development we had um, had, in, in the, in, especially in Europe, especially in Germany, is uh, looking to the windmills as you just mentioned. Uh, we we built up our first windmill 25 years ago at cost of two of 20 euro cent at that time. Nowadays we are talking about about five to six euro cent. <coughs> The same experience we have been made with the uh, solar uh, panels. <clears throat> um, ten years ago, we talked about we talked about costs around about forty to fifty euro cent a kilowatt hour. Nowadays, we are talking about ten. And looking to Turkey, we I th I'm very much convinced that we are able to produce electricity from solar panels at a cost, cost let me say, five to six cent per kilowatt hour in Kaisley, perhaps, with three thousand hours of sunshine uh, a year. <clears throat> so. Uh, there has been a dramatic uh, um, um, development in technologies, especially to the efficiency from getting electricity from sun or getting electricity from, from wind. And, that, um, and we have to focus on research and development, especially on research work, further research work <clears throat> to reduce costs for the renewables. Uh, that could be the solution uh, for, ours, for our companies um, to invest in these technologies and to help uh, especially emerging countries to invest in these technologies. I share what, what, what you said on the technology side. I think the other piece that you were not pronounced about was um, the role in the technologies in, in the distribution grids. Also there we will see very dramatic changes mm -hmm. uh, moving toward uh, direct current uh, connections uh, yeah. with, with much uh, lesser losses uh, much smarter applications. I think we have learned now, you know, a lot of, of, of 
solutions already that we didn't know. We had built, for example, a wind park on a small island off the Swedish Baltic coast. First calculation was if we bring if we want to bring all the power on land, we need to invest 300 million in, in, the, in the transmission distribution. Then when we started analyzing, said what technology is measuring temperature, uh, adapting the production the, to the, to the, to the off-wheeling, we found a solution that only costs 20 million and we, all, we just leave 1% of the power behind. So in comparison, just by being smarter in the distribution and transmission, we improve the business case dramatically. And all those things will become much more regular. Mm -hmm. Now, what does it mean? It means tons of opportunities stemming from, from new technologies, from the distributed, the renewable side, the distribution, the transmission side. On the other side, this tons of opportunities means also there is lots of risk. Because the life cycle of some technologies might be shorter than we think. Okay. For example, in right. 2060, will wind play the same role as today? I don't know. Might depend on solar and some other solutions, solar plus battery and some other solutions that wind already might at some point move over its, uh, its, its biggest uh, peak. Might not. But that uncertainty means, you know, whenever you place an investment debt, it, you know, the traditional calculations of utilities or oh, lifetime is, I don't know, 25 or for nuclear power stations, 50 years. I would think just starting that calculation is extremely risky. Uh, because you have not a clue uh, about the that environment that your animal will compete in in 25 or 50 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Therefore, the way you finance, the way you partner, uh, the way you, you, you handle your risk will become extremely important. Thus, uh, utilities and energy investors need to be extremely agile, mobile, adaptable, and that's all qualities that were not traditional strengths of utilities more the opposite.